Yannis, thank you for joining us at Union Solidarity International. Um, this is the first of our, our web conferences and uh, we hope to do a lot more of them in future. Uh, we hope to be able to meet with interesting people from around the world and talk about some of the crucial issues. Um, we consider you to be one of the foremost experts in what's happening, not only in Greece, but uh, certainly understanding the deeper roots of the financial crisis and where it comes from and the crucial point that we find ourselves in um, as neoliberalism uh, attempts its final assault on um, on Europe. So, um, welcome to this web conference and thank you for joining us. Well, thank you and thank you for the efforts of uh, Union Solidarity International. I think that what you, you guys are up to uh, is uh, magnificent. Uh, in, in this day and age, in these dark ages of ours, uh, such efforts are um, sine qua non. It's, it's, it, 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 we are so fragmented mm -hmm. and so demoralized by this train wreck that is Europe and the global economy that uh, solidarity is the, the, the last thing all for all of us. Because mm -hmm. obviously it's a crucial period for Greece at the moment with the elections coming up. Um, how do you, how, where do you think we are? What is the situation currently? Well, let me, let, let me use an, an, a metaphor. In 2008 yeah. we had the derailment of uh, the global model of um, surplus production and recycling that was established following the 1971 collapse of the first post-war um, phase with, with the collapse of Bretton Woods. For 20, 30 years after that, neoliberalism was simply um, a term mm -hmm. associated, an ideological cover for a particularly interesting and highly unstable form of uh, global capitalist in inverted commas development. That model was derailed in 2008. Mm -hmm. And um, following some frantic uh, moves by the G20, in particular by the several banks of, and the governments of the main Western countries, as well as China, um, a semblance of normality was uh, detained, but underneath the surface, the derailment continued. In Europe, the first uh, carriage who have left the tracks was Greece. Mm -hmm. But ever since, we've been watching in slow motion this derailment. One carriage after the other follows. It really doesn't matter who is in the driving seat, as, as, as long as the uh, prescription for uh, solving this problem or addressing this disease, this derailment, is uh, the one we've been having so far, which is to tighten the belt of those who were not uh, responsible for the, uh, the derailment of labor and continue to treat a cascade of insolvencies or bankruptcies as if they were liquidity difficulties and therefore trying to patch them up at sticky tape by means of huge loans that were provided only um, on condition of austerity, which reduced the income of the various member states of the Eurozone from which those uh, loans would have to be repaid. So, Greece is simply not just a canary in the mine, but also the laboratory in which misanthropic and idiotic policies are being uh, concocted, which are then exported to Ireland, to Portugal, to Scotland, to even to Germany itself. And the result is that we're going to have no winners in the end. This is not the typical class struggle where the, the victories of capital against labor translate into higher surplus value and profit for the capitalist class. This is a spectacular failure, 1929, 1930-like, mm -hmm. where in the end, everybody's a loser, except, of course, for the serpent's egg that hatches and produces its neo-Nazi or Nazi um, with its snakes. If anyone has a question, please feel free either to ask it um, by speaking um, or by typing it into the chat window. Um, 
the, I, I think the, the crucial thing um, for those of us who are not in Greece, um, so certainly those of us in the United Kingdom, um, as we are, but also throughout the rest of Europe and indeed the rest of the world, is what can we do, number one, and what can we learn, number two. Now, what should be done in uh, solidarity with Greece? Well, the first thing that should be done in solidarity with Greece is to understand that this is not a great crisis. If you can keep thinking of it as a great crisis, they are doing a major disservice to Greece and to themselves. Because they, they, they fail to see the reasons why their own countries are in dire straits. So, that's my, 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 my simple two-point answer to your question. Firstly, understand that uh, the causes of the crisis of the Ponzi austerity that we are in, that is an austerity plan that simply can't work, mm -hmm. So it's like a pyramid that will collapse. Yeah. It's founded on the foundation of the Ponzi growth that we had before. And secondly, that when the whole thing uh, explodes, as it all implodes, as it did, then uh, we must understand that we're all in this together. This is why it's so important to, to have uh, solidarity movements like yours, in order to understand that there is no such thing as the Greeks and the Brits and the Germans and the Italians. They're just people who have um, just as much in common as they have uh, indifference with one another, the great differences are to be found within our countries, mm -hmm. not across our countries. And this is a, 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 a huge lesson that we should have learned in the 1930s. At some point we did learn it, I think, but then after the 1970s we, we tended to forget it under the influence of this hodgepodge of pseudo-ideology that uh, presents themselves in the form of neoliberalism. Yanis, thank you very much. Um, we've had a number of very good questions which uh, participants have posted in the, the chat window on the left. Maybe um, if you could take a moment to see some of the questions that have come in and, uh, and, and uh, look at answering some of them. Is it realistic to hope that the left government can make it with uh, the capital against them, uh, apart from the European Union countries already against it? I'm not exactly what it means. This is a question from Maria. I suppose the question is, is it realistic to hope that the, a government of the left uh, could make a, a positive contribution? An election of the radical left party, a, a victory, an electoral victory on, on the part of the radical left party in Greece is another such possibility, another such chance. Something will have to give in Europe. Now, it could be on the political front, like the election of a left-wing government in Athens, or it could be the complete collapse of the French banking system, for instance. Something will give. And I believe that it is in the interest of everyone. Interestingly, I believe it is also in the interest of capital that you have an election of a central left-wing government in a place like Greece, or somewhere else, it doesn't have to be Greece, which simply says to the European Union, you know, enough. This prescription is poisoning the patient, and there will be no winners out of this, and there will be no salvation at the end of this line. And thank you, Maria, for asking that question. Uh, Stephanie says that uh, refers to, uh, to, to a book post on my blog by Marshall Auerbach, um, uh, a financier and also commentator on the Euro crisis, who makes, and, and Stephanie said, Marshall makes two bold statements in, in our particular blog post. First, that an exit by one member of the European Union of the Eurozone will bring an end to the entire project. And secondly, the solvency crisis can only be dealt with by the ECB, the European Central Bank, which has a perfect balance sheet to absorb losses. So I suspect that Stephanie wants me to comment on that. I think that Marshall is absolutely spot on, and something I've been saying now for years, that the way that the Eurozone is structured, there is absolutely no way one member state can leave, especially during a crisis like this one, without the whole Eurozone collapse. So, I will uh, second Marshall's point on this. And the reason is very simple. I recall why the Eurozone was put together. It was put together because the first stab by the European Union at creating a stable regime of exchange rates if you recall the ERM, the exchange rate mechanism of the European Union, prior to the creation of the EU, which actually the United Kingdom was part of. Um, that attempt failed, and it failed because every European country 
retained its own currency, but they tried to lessen the variation in the exchange rate between, to bind them together in a kind of loose euro, where there would be some room for movement up and down of the Deutsche Mark vis-à-vis -vis the, the, the UK sterling, vis-à-vis -vis the Italian lira and so on, but those exchange rate fluctuations were going to be kept within limits by means of government intervention, central bank intervention. And the reason why Europe wanted to do that was because if you try to have a single market uh, and you have a lot of fluctuations in exchange rates, then that those fluctuations can be trade and make it very hard to have a single market. So they tried to do that, and it failed. You will recall that John Major, the British Prime Minister, lost his shirt as a result of trying to stay within that mechanism against speculation. Uh, including by people like George Soros, back against the Bank of England, and broke the bank. So the, the euro came as a result of that failure. They said to themselves, the European leaders, these attempts to lessen the fluctuations and exchange rates between uh, our, our currencies are bound to fail because it's like inviting speculators to speculate that they can break these limits, these limitations. So what we need to do is when we need to blend those currencies in, to fix them completely and utterly, and to make it absolutely incomprehensible for speculators to speculate that that union, monetary union, can be broken. And the only way you can do that is by having a common currency from which there is no So the fact that there is, a, there is no legal means for getting out of the euro system, even if you want to, or for expelling someone from the European Union, if you don't want them, like Greece is un completely and utterly unwanted by the rest of the Europe at the moment. But probably not just Greece, Portugal, and other countries as well. The reason why there is no such process is because, no, it's not because they forgot to add these provisions in the treaties that brought together the Eurozone. It was planned not to have an exit. Mm -hmm. And it, with good reason. The, the only reason why no one is speculating against the solidity of the United States of America is because no one can even conceptualize and envision the possibility that California would be leaving the Union or that Ohio would be leaving the Union. So no speculator is going to speculate to bet that California will be thrown out of the Union. So that was precisely the point. Now, the moment Mrs. Merkel idiotically in November of 2011, as a result of if she had with another inane politician, the Greek Prime Minister of the time, Mr. Papandreou, mentioned, you know, on a whim, said, oh, well, you know, if Mr. Papandreou wants to have a referendum, then this referendum would be about Greece's um, membership of the European, of the, of the Euro system. Effectively, what she did was, she cast out on the solidity of the Euro system. She effectively, uh, destroyed the unity of every Eurozone apparatchik, functionary, bureaucrat, politician up until that moment, that the EU system is not negotiable. That once you're in it, you can't get out. By mentioning the possibility of a Greek exit, a Grexit, as they say now, from the Euro, and using it now as part of the chicken game with the Athens government, Effectively, and the, and, and the Greek people saying, unless you vote for the parties we want you to vote for, we are going to threaten you with an exit from the euro. Effectively, what they are saying is, the euro is no longer unitary. The euro can open up. And if Greece can leave, why can't somebody else leave? Why not Portugal? Portugal is in exactly the same, same kind of uh, this state of disrepair as Greece is. Why not Ireland? And if not Ireland, and if Ireland, why not Spain? And if Spain, why not Italy? And where, where does that end? It, it ends somewhere along the Rhine. So there is actually no euro left. You have the Deutsche Mark land there. So, you know, the, the Bundesbank might as well, as well move into the office of the ECB, which are next door in the same city, Frankfurt. Mm -hmm. So the moment you start raising the prospect of fragmentation, mm -hmm. you give speculators a field of glory yeah. on which to practice their speculation. And once you do that, the euro is history. And if one country gets out, then the bets will be on as to who's coming next. And this is a self-fulfilling prophecy. So Marshall is completely right. That's what I've been saying so, all, all along. That doesn't mean that they won't do it. That, that they won't expel a country like Greece out from the year. 
uh, they've done silly at least in the past. Uh, Europe is perfectly capable of shooting itself in the foot. But this is the point that Marshall and I are making, that it will be shooting itself in the, in the, in, in the foot if Greece is exposed. The second thing is about the ECB. Yes, look, whether we like it or not, just like in the United States, the Fed, the Federal Reserve, Reserve the Central Bank of the United States, <coughs> is the only institution that has prevented the grapes of wrath from returning to the United States, that has prevented the, the Great Depression from um, re returning, revisiting North America, is the Fed. Through ill means and good, through quantitative easing, it has managed to maintain some degree of economic activity. Uh, the United States is difficult. The social economy of the United States is suffering badly. The, the working people of the United States, after 20, 30 years of seeing the median wage squeeze, they are having a, a, a serious problem. But um, nevertheless, they have, we have not gone in the United States. They have not returned to where they were in 1930, 1931, under Cuba. So the, the Central Bank, during the, the catastrophe, during the collapse, plays an important role. Uh, and, and the Central Bank should be doing exactly the same thing here in, in, in Europe. And it is not. And it is not because its hands are tied behind its back. And uh, it is not playing the role that it could play. Yeah, I'm not saying that the Central Bank could, could fix the crisis. It couldn't. But at least it could, make, it could slow it down. And it could give politics an opportunity to respond a bit more creatively than it, than it has so far. Nicola is asking, what is the difference between uh, PASOK 2009 and Syriza 2012 in terms of uh, what is deliverable? PASOK is a, an establishment party of government. It has been one since at least the late 1980s. It was in the 1970s. One can draw an interesting parallel between Syriza today and PASOK in the 1970s, when PASOK was a radical party quite a radical party by European standards. It was far much to the left of, of the equivalent European Social Democratic parties. But 30 years in government has changed it completely, has mutated. And by 2009, PASOK was another establishment party uh, promising anything that it thought would entice enough voters in order to do to, 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 to the spoils of power. Citizen is almost an unwilling protagonist in uh, Greek politics. It was a party that up until a few months ago, at least until, um, until the, not the last election, but the election before that, it was a party that was struggling to stay in parliament, hovering around four, four and a half, five percent of the vote, when the cutoff point is three. It was a party that was um, very inward looking in the sense that just like the left always has a pension for, um, it contained a number of different um, uh, tendencies and they were more interested in negotiating and uh, debating with one another than planning or preparing for government. Um, and suddenly this crisis thrust this small party onto the big league. Suddenly they became a large party and suddenly they are contesting for government. So they are having to go through a massive transformation from being a small, radical, protest-based party to being a, a party of government. They didn't actually ask for it in, <laughs> in interesting ways. I mean, they did, but not really. It was thrust upon them. And they, they didn't get to where they, they are now because of promises they made. They got to where they are now, that is, uh, running for government, because the political scenery just completely and utterly collapsed. The two establishment parties, the socialists, also, uh, and the conservatives, New Democracy, simply imploded. And it was just like, you know, the Twin Towers crashing with lots of dust and debris lying around. And Syriza was the uh, onlooker almost that had to rise to the occasion and, and contest policies as a governing party. So there's a profound difference between the anthropology of the people of Syriza today and the anthropology of the people of the Socialist Party in 2009. Um, I strongly suspect it's my feeling that Syriza um, 
members and uh, leading politicians are not that keen to be in government. They're almost reluctant to be in government. Um, so that, that is a profound difference with the socialists in 2009, who were actually starved of power after having lost the 2004 election and eager to get their hands on the lever of power once again. Uh, Yanis, um, Rani would like to know why the why Britain never joined the eurozone. Uh, did they have did they did they have a, an advanced suspicion of uh, what was to come? Well, as, you, as I'm sure you're very well aware, Britain stayed out. Did, Britain did the right thing of staying out of the eurozone for the wrong reasons. <laughs> and it's perfectly possible to do the right thing for the wrong reason. You know, it, it, happens, it happens to the best and to the worst of us. <laughs> In Britain, if you remember, they, both political parties, <clears throat> the Tories and uh, uh, the Labour Party, were sort of torn and um, uh, divided on the basis of membership of the user. Um, in one sense, the Conservative Party government of Mr. Major imploded, firstly because of what happened with the ARM and Major's commitment to staying, stick to it and then losing to speculators and to George Soros in 1992, which brought on a major debate within the, the Tory party as to whether um, Britain should put all its eggs in the European Union basket and whether it should move towards more integration with Europe or less. Um, at the same time, you had Tony Blair in the Labour Party, a rising party, converting Labour into New Labour, and being very much in favour, at least in the, in the early stages, of joining the year. Mm -hmm. uh, so it was all up in the air whether Britain would join the year or not. In my understanding of the essence of the argument in the United Kingdom, both in Labour and in in the Conservative Party. By the way, the only party that was staunchly in favour of it was the Lib Dem at the time, but they were a very small party and insignificant, so I'm not going to refer to them. But I think that the, 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 main, the, the main contest in the UK regarding the euro was between the city and industry. The city did not want the euro. And the city did, did not want the euro because they, the one thing that city bankers do not want is any, any hint of smidgen of the possibility of uh, uh, a chance that it will be regulated. So they fear Brussels a lot more than they fear London because London, the London government is in the pockets of the city, whereas Brussels tends to be a little bit less um, uh, prone to uh, satisfy every whim of the city of London. So finance capital in, uh, in the UK was not at all keen to enter the Eurozone. On the other hand, British industry, whatever it was left of it after the, the culling of British industry by the Tories in the 1980s, was staunchly in favor. And, it was, yeah, and you can see why. Because uh, the, it, it, staying outside the Euro during the pre crisis period meant that British interest rates had to be higher than the ones in Europe. And uh, that also gave rise to uh, an exchange rate of the, the pound sterling being uh, um, at the level which was impeding British exports to the Eurozone. So the industry, British industry, was very keen to enter the Euro, and they were the ones who were favouring the, the Europhiles, both in the Labour Party and uh, the Tories. The City of London was uh, actively fighting against entry to the Euro. And they won. So, for the com precisely the wrong reasons, so that the City of London would continue unimpeded to take the bubble for the first in 2008, Britain ended up outside the Euro, which then ended up being a great boon for Britain, because when the whole financial sector collapsed internationally, <laughs> starting in Wall Street and then the City of London, the flexibility that um, <coughs> Britain had as a, as a result of being able to value the pound, uh, and of running its own macroeconomic policy independently of the Australian uh, logic of Mrs. Merkel and Mr. Sarkozy, uh, 
was essential in limiting, not uh, annihilating, but not not uh, cancelling, but limiting the effects of the savage recession on Britain. Yanis, thank you. Um, Chris clarified uh, an earlier point, which uh, perhaps I misrepresented. Uh, he wants to know, can the Eurozone be saved without big fiscal transfers? Um, and also, Eva <coughs> is asking, um, the UK and US also seem to be suffering from debt problems. So is this a deeper crisis than a Eurozone crisis? Of course it's a deep crisis. It's a crisis of global, ca global capitalism. But that doesn't mean that a global crisis is experienced everywhere with the same intensity. Um, the United States is uh, in deep trouble, as I said before. It is just hanging on um, at the edge of the precipice. Its working class is suffering from its pain, as we speak. Its industry is not finding its voice. Its fin finances, public finances, are a basket case. China is in trouble too. Brazil even though it is growing, is extremely worried. Places like Australia and New Zealand may be benefiting from the commodities market boom, but they are facing their own credit crunch and their own real estate collapse around the corner. So the global economy is in trouble. But Europe, Europe is a different case. Because in Europe, we have bound together 17 nations <laughs> it resembles a river boat. Think of a river boat. You take it out to the open seas, to the North Sea or to the Pacific Ocean. When the seas are calm, it sails magnificently. That was the Europe between 2000 and 2008. When there is a storm, though, this river boat starts leaking everywhere and, and sinking. And just to, to, to demonstrate that, think of the 1930s, the Great Depression in the United States. The, the, you know, the dust bowls, the, the, great, the grapes of wrath. It was a dust bowl. And yet, the one thing nobody had to worry about was the breakdown of the United States of America. The breakup of its states, of the Federation, into small states or independent states. Texas did not leave, California did not even think of leaving, even though um, can, uh, states like Ohio and Illinois require fiscal promise from California or from the richer parts of the United States to those parts. Now, you can say that that was because of the nation, they had a the national uh, identity and all that. It's more than that. It was because the economic system, so, especially the financial and banking system, was so integrated, it was impossible to break up. In Europe, this crisis, even though our debt crisis is less of a debt crisis than the one in the United States. Europe does not have, have the same debt problem that the United States has. And yet, we're breaking up. Why is that? It's because the edifice was badly designed. The architecture was rubbish. <laughs> and only took a little bit of tremor in 2008, but actually it was a big tremor, to, to see it collapse. And so let me answer the question directly. Uh, the question is, do we need huge fiscal transfers? This is such a fallacy, which is being perpetrated and pushed by Mrs. Merkel and her many uh, ministers against the edicts of rationality. Think about, again, the United States, which is a good example, because it's a currency union that works. I mean, it has all these problems, but as a currency union, it doesn't have a problem. Nobody is talking about the fragmentation of the dollar zone. In 1932, we had a defeat of, of, of austerity in the United States. Remember, when the, the crash happened in 1929, between 29 and 32, we had the government of Herbert Hoover, President Hoover. President Hoover was the Mrs. Merkel of the time. Very simple, or the Miss Cameron of the time. Effectively, what, what was he saying? He was saying that we had, we had a crash, because it was caused by too much debt, so we have to reduce the debt. How do we reduce, do we reduce the debt? We tighten debts. So we reduce government spending, okay? We reduce benefits and to labor. Because if we squeeze labor, we reduce wages, then employers will employ more people and we have a government. So as a result of that strategy, 
but Australian logic by Herbert Hoover. <laughs> it was the Second World War, effectively. It was the fact that they had a complete and utter descent from a recession, from a stock exchange crash, to a complete catastrophe at the human level. In 1932, the American people realized that, and they booted their partners out, and they voted uh, FDR, President Roosevelt. Okay? Now, what did Roosevelt do? <clears throat> it's not that he, he made magnificent progress, but he made some progress with the New Deal. What was the New Deal? We have a lot of lessons to learn here from Roosevelt's New Deal. It was not, there is nothing more to the <laughs> surplus states of the United States, to New York State, to Texas, and to California to say, guys, we need fiscal transfers from you to the poor states, to the deficit states. Okay. He didn't go to California and ask the state of California to guarantee the debt of a higher. He did not ask the state of California to borrow jointly with the state of Ohio, you know, joint euro bonds, equivalent of US bonds, that will be guaranteed by California and by Ohio. No, he did something else. He created a new form, a new class of debt, and that was federal. California did not have to back, backstop, did not have to guarantee, and, and used this new class of bond, if you want, in order to do something very simple. You see, during a crisis, a crisis is not just a debt crisis, it's a savings crisis too. It sounds very strange to lots of people, but this is precisely the reality of a crisis. You have a mountain of debt, people have debt that they cannot repay, people and firms and governments, and you have a mountain of savings. Imagine if you now had a hundred billion euros, let's say. Much. What would you do with it? You wouldn't sleep at night. You couldn't put it in a bundle and put it under your bed. It's just too much. In which bank, which bank would you trust your, with your 100 billion? Which company you invested in? You would have no idea. This is what's happening at the moment. You have people with debts and they don't know what to do with that. And you have people with surpluses and they don't know what to do with that. So, and this was the case in 1932. And Roosevelt thought of a way of shifting idle savings into productive investments that would move the economy, put people to work, generate the income so that the tax could be repaid. Yeah, that was a new deal. We need a new deal for you. That's what fiscal transfers. What we need to do is we have to have a situation where part of the debt of Europe is homogenized, neutralized. Because it's ridiculous to have Germany at the moment borrowing at 0%. Free money for Germany, right? When Spain is insolvent, and when we want to be, to, 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 to maintain this this eurozone, if we do, you can't have that kind of distinction in interest rates. When one is absolutely insolvent, the other borrows for free. And at the same time, you don't want the German taxpayer to be subsidizing Spanish debt. So how do you deal with this problem? This is where the European Central Bank can come and play the role of a go-between the markets and the various states borrow on its own account at a low interest rate and reduce the interest rate and equilibrate the interest rates within the Eurozone. And in association with the European Investment Bank, which is twice the size of the World Bank and has a very long tradition and a very good track record at initiating investment projects, the EIB, the European Investment Bank, would be the pillar of growth in Europe in association with the ECB with the European Central Bank, they put a new deal for the European continent as a whole, not just for the, the Eurozone. Because only growth can get you out of the mire of the depression, just like 1932, equally now. And that does not mean fiscal transfers, it means a rational management of the debt and a new deal which shifts investments, savings that have, have nowhere to go, into profiting investments. So nobody loses. This is the beauty of and the tragedy of a crisis. In a crisis, class struggle breaks down. It's not that my benefit is your loss. Everybody loses. This is the irrationality of the crisis. Which means that, it, and this is the beauty of it, we have a chance for a mutual gain for everyone to, to win within the Eurozone. So there is no transfer in the end. And to win 
within the Eurozone. So there is no transfer in the end. Um, Janis, thank you. Um, there are more questions. Firstly, a number of people have raised the position of Germany. Uh, there have been different questions about Germany, but there have been questions like, what about the pressure Germany is coming under from the United States and um, Hollande and, and people within Europe to change their tack? Uh, essentially, how, how pivotal is Germany in, in the decisions about what happens next? Uh, then Jorgos is asking, um, one of the biggest problems we face across Europe is propaganda. Um, he refers even to um, lies targeted against you and against the worldview that, that you propose. Um, how do you get people to shift outside of the austerity-driven train and actually um, begin to not only believe that, that an alternative is possible, but uh, is desirable and is indeed necessary? Well, let's begin with, um, with the question about Germany and the United States. The United States after 2008, has lost its hegemonic position worldwide. It's still an important country. It has a, a significant role to play, or can play a significant role, I don't know whether it will, but it's not a hegemon that was between 1944 and 2008. It is quite instructive that last se September, <coughs> excuse me, uh, the U.S. Treasury Secretary, Mr. Tim Dreiter, uh, came to Europe, with a very explicit mission of uh, talking European finance ministers into uh, changing their paths and doing, taking very specific, simple steps for uh, shoring up the Eurozone. And effectively, he was chucked out. He was thrown out of the meeting. And you had uh, inane finance ministers like the Austrian saying that, oh, how dare the Americans lecture us on Europe when their debt is worse. Obviously not understanding that the problem is not debt, the problem is architecture. So, the U.S. tries to impress upon Mrs. Merkel the urgency of the situation and the, and, and the fact that Europe is just about to commit suicide and uh, bring down with it the rest of the global economy. But I very much fear that the European Union does not feel that it needs to listen to the United States anymore. They listened to them when they didn't. They shouldn't have listened to them. That was before 2008. And they're not listening to them now that they should. Um, similarly with all the cajoling talk by Mr. Cameron into Mrs. Merkel's ear. It goes in one, in one ear and out of the other, simply because the, the United Kingdom is irrelevant. <laughs> it's the worst of the ill. Now, regarding the climate of terrorism, this is what we get when we have an economic implosion. When we have an economic implosion, political dialogue suffers. Everything suffers. With a wholesale breakdown in the networks of communication, of decency, of political discourse. This is why the Nazis and the anti-Semites and the anti-immigrants and the misanthropists find uh, fertile ground on which to grow their menacing narratives. And in that climate, maintaining a reasoned dialogue is extremely difficult. But we have no choice other than to persevere. Janus, thank you very much uh, for a very enlightening contribution, which I am sure our listeners have, have enjoyed. Um, we, we appreciate your insights into, into what's happening because it brings a lot of clarity to a situation which is often extremely complex. Uh, so thank you very much for, for joining us. Well, thank you. And once, once more, congratulations to you, Sai, for everything you're doing. Thank you, Janus. Thanks, Janus. Um, and also, I'd like to thank um, everyone else who has taken the trouble to log in um, today and to ask questions and to participate in this. It's the first time we've done it. Um, we hope that you didn't have any serious technical hitches and that it went smoothly. We hope to do it in the future, um, regularly, perhaps once a week. And uh, we very much welcome your participation.